Step number four, and once again, I want to put it in the context of, of what I've been talking about this time, is, is about how the steps are really following what I would call the charge-discharge kind of formula. So what do I mean by that? Well, what's happening is that in step one, we end up having this existential crisis that we're powerless over what we've been doing in our life that's been causing so much damage. We don't have any idea of how to turn this around and we finally face that. It's that moment of waking up and seeing just how wrong that we've been in terms of how self-destructive that we've been in our lives. So that creates this existential crisis. We know that what we're doing isn't working, but we don't have anything new yet to replace it. And that's by definition an existential crisis. You're letting go of something that doesn't work, but you don't have anything new to replace it. So that creates a certain charge inside of us, right? We need to have this crisis because there's a lot of existential anxiety that comes with an existential crisis. We've got to resolve that. And that's where step two comes along. And in step two, we become hopeful. And hope resolves that existential crisis, that there is a new possibility for us. That's what step two is telling us. There's a new possibility in life. So now we have hope. Now the hope starts to build up a charge. There is a new way, but what is that? How am I going to be able to discover these possibilities? So now there's another charge building up because hope without any kind of a manifestation just becomes an empty promise, doesn't it? Um, or become a false hope is a better way to say it. The empty promise comes in step three. So now we need something, right? We need some kind of a way of discharging this charge of hope that we have, that there's a new possibility. And now step three comes along, right? made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. So now at this step, the way I've talked about it is we're making a commitment to discover a new way of life. We're making a commitment to discover our true self, that we can see that we've been lost and that the steps are going to help us recover our lost true self. So now we're making this decision, right? We've made this decision and, and we're turning. And I talked a lot about the turning last time. We're turning away from the false self. We're turning tr towards a true self. You know, we're making this commitment to a new way of life. So here's the charge again. But once again, a commitment without some kind of a manifestation of action becomes just an empty promise. And we're all familiar with empty promises. How many times did I say, I'll stop drinking? This is it. I've had it. I'm not going to drink again. I'm not going to use again. I'm not going to do this. or I'm not going to do that. You know, our lives have been filled with these empty promises. And until we somehow mobilize ourselves to take a specific action, then we are not going to be able to discover this new way of life. Now, step four is that invitation, right? We made a, you know, a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. So I want to start by talking about that this is the first tangible evidence that we are going to have of our commitment to discovering a new possibility in our life. And it's tangible because now we're really being asked to do something. The other steps that we've just made a decision, right? We came to believe, you know, we admit it. Those are things that we've done. Now we're asked to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves and to sit down and put pen to paper and really get honest with ourselves like we've never been honest before. This is the way that this step is described in the big book. He goes, Bill, this is Bill's writing, of course. Now we launched out on a course of vigorous action. The first step, which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us have never attempted. 
Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. That's Bill's word, that have been blocking us. We're going to see that one of the things that we need to face that's been blocking us in terms of the uh, achieving emotional sobriety is our emotional dependency. That's what's been blocking us from being able to step stand on our own two feet, from being able to finally mature in life. So we need to have a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom. So we had to get down to causes and conditions. So that's what we're facing in this step. We're facing causes and conditions. And before we talk about how we're going to face those things, I want to spend some time now discussing our resistance to working these steps. Because that has to be addressed. You cannot work these steps without becoming aware of the part of you that doesn't want to work them. We're asked to make a searching and fearless moral inventory, searching and fearless. How come the word fearless has been inserted in this step? Why didn't we just say a searching moral inventory? What is this fearless? How come we have to be courageous in this effort? Well, this is what we're up against. And and this is a very important thing to become aware of. We have to be fearless because we are going to now have a stark confrontation with our false self. Now, as we've discussed it before, our false self is based on a tyranny of the shoulds. It's an idealized self. It says, this is the way, this is the blueprint of who I have to be to be okay. And in that blueprint are all of these demands about how I'm supposed to be. And this is an idealized self. So this means if I'm this way, absolutely this way, I'll be okay. And if I'm anything less than this, I'm not. So when I adhere to the demands that this blueprint of my false self have created, then I feel a false pride. Look at who I am. I'm great. I'm perfect. When I'm not is the important thing here. And this is where the fearless comes in. When I am not who I should be, it unleashes self-hate. It unleashes the experience of what we call the despised self. I now see parts of myself that I can't tolerate, that I hate. I'm not supposed to be this way. And God forbid anybody sees them, they're not going to love me. I'm not going to belong. I'm not going to be okay. The basic anxiety that was resolved when we adopted this blueprint to this false self is now going to be re-experienced in our working step four. We are going to confront our despised self. We are going to see ourselves in a way that we haven't wanted to. You know, every one of us has, is guilty of selective inattention. We only see the things that we want to see. We don't see who we really are. We see ourselves in our idealized image. And that's a serious problem because as soon as you see these other parts of you that aren't okay, you're going to hate yourself. And when someone's despised self becomes all that they can see, when they have no hope that they can be their their false self, that's when people decide to kill themselves. We call it the anti-self gets so big and so strong and that, that they despise themselves to such a degree, the conclusion is the world would be better off without me. And this is the only way my pain is going to stop. So confronting this despised self is such an important part of this experience, which is why Bill called us to be fearless. If we stop, if we don't confront 
this despised self in this journey that we're taking, we are not going to be able to be rigorously honest. Now, it helps if what you understand when you're confronting this is that the false self, this despised self, is just a creation. It's a, it's a construction of the false self. It's not really. It's, <laughs> you know, that's where it's, that there's this other part of it. A lot of the ideas of who I'm supposed to be and who I'm not, it's a big lie. It's based on a myth that only certain things are okay for me to be. When all of me is okay to be, I'm a human comma being. So we're being confronted now with with that, with this existential reality of who we are. I'm a great guy and I'm I'm an asshole. I mean, that's the reality of it. And before I only wanted to see the great parts of me. That's what my false self said. You're only going to love me is if I create the right image. All about image. Remember the Canon commercials? Image is everything. I remember they had Andre Agassi up there. Nobody knew at that time that all his hair he had on his head was false hair. It was a wig. (laughs) Image is everything. Image is everything. So this is what we're up to. Now, the one thing I want you to hear loud and clear If you hear nothing else I've said tonight, only the best in you can see the worst in you. Only the best in you can see the worst in you. Only the best in you can be honest with what's really going on and be able to own it. Name it to tame it, as we say, (laughs) is to be able to own what's really going on. That's the best in you because the force that is being unleashed, you know, when we say came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, what's going to restore us to sanity is that force inside you and me that moves us towards wholeness, that moves us towards self-actualization, that has that self-realization become such an important part of. And that's the best in us. When we're anchored in that, then I can own that because I know there's a bigger truth than just that despised self. I know that that's a part of me. It's not all of me. But before the false self would be, would say to me, a part of you becomes all of you. See, that's that's the craziness in terms of what goes on is a false self would get me to believe that any one part of me defines me. That's not true. That's nonsense. We talk all the time about the, you know, the sum of the parts, right? The, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That's the truth of it. I'm all of that. And I have those other parts of me, but they don't define me. What defines me is how I, you know, how I put my Humpty Dumpty together again how I coordinate all these different parts of me that have been fragmented and fractured in my life. So that's the fearless, the fearless. And when we start to do that, trust me, there will be a resistance. My dear friend, Herb Kagan, he starts out to every year, he does these year long workshops on this 12 steps. And he typically starts out now with about 200 people signed up for his workshop. And they're all gung-ho and they're showing up to meetings and he's still got 200 people at step three. And then step four comes along. What do you think happens? The group gets cut in half. And these are people that have been in the program, say they're committed to recovery. 50% of those folks drop out of his workshop when they get to step four. Bill talks about this step separating the men from the boys and that back then it was the gender issue, but it's, it's this step, step four is not for the faint of heart because it's going to be, it's going to take a searching and fearless effort to take a look at who we are. And we'll start to talk about that last time, but I just wanted to put this in the context of what we're doing. 
And this is going to what we need to do is to see who I am. I need to own who I am before I can have any possibility of becoming someone different. And that's why this step is such an important step. It's an owning step. It's a taking responsibility for myself. And, and, and in many cases, maybe the first time in my life of taking any responsibility. So with that said, I will turn this over to my dear friend and colleague, Tom Rutledge. Tom? Thanks, Alan. Beautiful. And, and as always, I took about three pages of notes there and it, it, it just changed my mind about anything I was going to say, what I'd planned to say before. Uh, I'd, I'd just taken a walk with my dog, Lucas. He and I talked about what I was going to say. And now, you know, I don't know why I plan, you know, I said, what the hell? But um, step, you know, one of the things people don't know about, they, they run, you know, from step four, they don't show up at Herb's thing is, uh, what we, part of what they don't know, part of what we don't know before we go there is if we do it right, it's an inventory, it's, a, it's an honest inventory. We're also going to find all kinds of good news in there. See, we're, 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 we're you know, we think of this searching moral fearless inventory. And of course, if you're just getting sober, I mean, I can lose myself as an example. When I was just getting sober, I mean, I wasn't going to find a lot of good stuff to look at in myself. It's, it's like I was, you know, it was that anything I did have that was good was false. It was like I was, you know, I was a, a hero of my own, my own mind. But, but when you really get into this, it's like therapy itself. It's, it's, um, you know, I, always, I, I, I kind of change language around instead of saying character defects, I say characteristics, for instance, and say, you know, and you and I talk about this a lot, Alan, that, that you know, the, there's two sides of every, of every characteristic. You know, I always say I'm a lazy man, and I, take, and I don't mean that as a negative thing. And if you want to take a vacation, take the lazy man with you. Don't, don't, don't take the driven man who, who is, can organize everything. Take me. But if you, need your, if you need organizational skills, don't come to me because I don't, I'm not going to be. So we want to do is we want to sort through and see what we have, both, both the things that are destructive and productive. And I really believe every, every symptom has its application. You know, I think, you know, we say somebody's stubborn. Well, what's the upside of stubborn? The determination. Sometimes stubborn is the, is the greatest thing in the world. Uh, you know, what's the down, you know, what's, what's uh, flexibility? Well, flexibility is a great thing, but what can it also be? It can be wishy-washy. You know, we, we can flip-flop and do all that stuff. So I want people to know, first of all, that there's, we're looking for the truth about ourselves. Now, the thing you talk about, you talked about a lot just then, which is something you and I, you and I talk about a lot. I, you know, I'm, I am a, I introduce myself as Tom. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm a recovering addict. I'm a recovering asshole. I'm a recovering self-hating person. You know, I, if I, I, I worked with this idea and as, when I was in therapy for so many years with people telling me I was self-critical and eventually I just realized that's such a lightweight way to say that. And I found since then, since I've identified myself as, as recovering from self-hatred, how many people perk, literally perk up when I'm talking about that, because now it's like somebody may understand how bad this is. So here's the fourth, the fourth step, a searching, fearless, moral inventory. You know, we're going to go in there and, and, and it is the first step of, it is to be the first step of act, actual is action toward emotional sobriety. It's like that. This is where emotional sobriety starts. The rest of it is all. It, it's extremely important. But sometimes I'll say it's like it's like propping the hood up so you can get to the engine. And when we get to the fourth step, we've got the hood up. We got our heads in there, and we're looking at we're looking at the engine. And we and we got to keep the hood up because if it clams, slams down on us, we got to go back and do one, two, three again. But we're going to do this. This is one of the things that I just, I could, you know, I, I want to be able to hand this to somebody when they first come see me. You're getting ready to take an inventory. You're ready to take a dive into, into some the most difficult work that anybody does. And you're going to do it at a time when you don't know your ass from a hole in the ground, at least the first time. I think one point we, we can make, and we can talk about it more later too, is all of the steps are, meant to be a daily practice they're not like you do, do you know you do them brush your hands off and say i'm so glad i've done my third step 
you know, it's like we have to come back and none, none more than the fourth step. It's something, you know, you don't clean your car one time. You don't wash the dishes one time. I mean, we all, we all know, I mean, it's actually a law of the universe. Even if you live alone, if, if you're washing dishes and you finish the very last dish, what happens? Somebody brings another dish. Even if you live alone, somebody brings another dish in and, and there's always one more dish to do. So the four steps like that, we got to keep, we got to keep doing that. But what, what I believe delivers us through this is this is our opportunity to learn about our courage. Um, I wrote um, one of my books is called Embracing Fear. And, and I, I don't tell this story a lot, but, but I'll, before I finish, I'll tell this. It's like, it's one of those spiritual moments. It's one of those, one of those moments that just, it was something outside of me or something inside of me or whatever, but, but I had, it was in the, it was back in the 1990s, uh, 1990 something, I believe it was. And I was invited uh, because of a book I'd written about self-forgiveness to do a lecture at my, my undergraduate alma mater. So I was really proud to, to be invited back to, to lecture at my, at my college because I had skipped out on all the lectures there when I was there. And so I wanted to see what it was like and, and, so I was there and I, and I wandered, I'll do the short version. I wandered through the campus the night before I did this lecture. And it was, it was as if somebody was, I mean, I, I have a lot of feelings of communication or somebody, somebody better than me is talking to me, but this was like, I was just, I was just being ta given a talking to. And it was, it was, it was Tom. He said, you know, the same thing is wrong with you today. That was wrong with you 20 years ago when you were walking on this campus. And it is, you are controlled by fear. You are still controlled by fear. And it gave me this, I actually included it in the book. This, this, I came home and wrote it, wrote, came back to my hotel and wrote it as fast as I could, but it was about understanding when fear is in charge, that's what blocks us. You use the word block. Bill uses the word block fear blocks us. And the idea is here, this is the fourth step to me is our chance to begin the process of learning how to be courageous. And it's also, I would also say this before I wrap this up too, the, there, there's no better, there's, I mean, there's examples everywhere, but there's no better example inside the working of the program than the need for a sponsor. You need somebody to, to be there with you through this. It's like, it's, it, and, you know, and it's like, and we need community. We need depth on the bench. We don't just need that one person, but, but in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you get through a fourth step without a sponsor, you know, having, having been there before you and explaining things to you and telling you what they've learned and, 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 and just being there so that while you're hating yourself, there's somebody there sitting there with you who still loves you. And that's, that's, that's such an important part about that because this is what we do with the fourth step. We go into that space that I call divine emptiness and that divine emptiness, you know, I define as those places that we get where we know so much more about who we are not than who we are. And that's what we're doing at the fourth step We're we're, we, we've already let go of a lot of identity stuff. I mean, for me, just letting go of alcohol was, was such a change of identity. And then when we get into this, we're letting go of identity. I don't know who the Holy fuck I am. And um, see how spiritual that is. It's not just fuck. It's Holy fuck. That was, that was a clinical yeah. term. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to speak over your head, but I don't know who the holy fuck I am, but, but what I'm, but I'm going to do this anyway. And it's like, and that's that divine emptiness. And, and when you're in that divine emptiness, our job is basically to get all the support we can just to be the keeper of the space. Cause what we're going to do, we're vulnerable to relapse. We're vulnerable to that addiction coming back in and saying, let's do this. We're vulnerable to the, to the, to the should monster that comes in and says, you know, you shouldn't even be here. You need to get the hell out of here. So this, this fourth step, just as a beginning point, as we get started with that today, is it's, it's that place of where we get to really practice courage. Uh, and courage is going to take us to the place. And I hope I get I'll just say this, something about this next time, is take us to the place where we're all really look, heading. And it's not personal happiness. It's self-respect. And that's, that's where this is going. And the fourth step is, is just 
to me fascinating and i'm really glad that on in the in the exchange with mary and i that i that i drew the fourth step That's so right. thank, thanks alan well thank you tom <laughs>